On today's episode, NASA returns to the moon, a $1 billion climate observatory makes it to orbit, new spacesuit designs are revealed, and a huge solar flare knocks out radio across the southern hemisphere. NASA payloads are on course for the moon as the commercial company Intuitive Machines makes their attempt at the first American lunar touchdown in more than 50 years. The mission, dubbed IM-1, will be attempting to send the 675-kilogram Odysseus lander into space on board a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket during a three-day window starting on February 14th at 12.57 a.m. Eastern and ending on the 16th. At the time of recording, Intuitive Machines and SpaceX are indicating that they are good to go for launch on the 14th, so it's very likely that the mission is already on course for the moon. IM-1 is aiming for a landing on February 22nd, taking six commercial and six NASA payloads to the lunar surface as part of the American Space Agency's Commercial Lunar Payload Services contract system. One of the more important NASA experiments on board is the stereo cameras for lunar plume surface studies, which will be bolted near the base of the hexagonal lander. SCALPS is a photogrammetry device that will use multiple cameras to document the landing process, creating a 3D view which will allow scientists to analyze the way IM-1 throws the lunar sand around as its engines come into contact with the surface. The physics of how an engine interacts with coarse particles is still being studied, with increased interest coming as the Artemis moon missions begin to plan for the first human habitation on the lunar surface. Understanding how repeated landings will erode the local environment, or even damage any nearby buildings, is something NASA is putting a lot of effort into. Aside from scalps, Odysseus is also equipped with a new tool that might give it a better chance of landing than its unfortunate competition, a new type of propellant measurement system. Many recent failed landers ended up crashing into the moon because of some sort of fuel issue. The Japanese Hakuto-R was a good example of this, having plummeted helplessly for three miles before smashing into the lunar surface, and a big reason is that fuel doesn't tend to move well in weightless environments. It clings to the tank walls in odd places and baffles most traditional ways of measuring how much fuel a vehicle has, leading to nominal readings when really the fuel is dangerously low. For IM-1, a new type of fuel gauge using radio waves and antenna inside the tanks will be measuring the propellant levels instead. Small-scale tests on the ISS and on zero-g airplane dives have been promising, and this will be the first real-world test of this sort of fuel measuring system, and it could prove to be really helpful on longer duration spaceflights. Like other commercial landers, IM-1 is a test for improvements on less expendable flights. Just like with Astrobotics Peregrine or JAXA Slim Lander, Intuitive Machines will be making the most of whatever happens on this mission to get the most amount of data for later. On February 8th, SpaceX launched NASA's $1 billion Pace Earth Observation Satellite into space aboard a Falcon 9. The flight left from the Space Force Station's Pad 40 at Cape Canaveral, shooting into a polar orbit more than 420 miles above the Earth's surface, where it will stay for at least three years, although NASA is hoping to use it for its full 10-year lifespan. PACE stands for Plankton Aerosol Cloud Ocean Ecosystem, which is less of a description and more of a target list. The observatory is equipped with three tools, which it will be using to scan the entirety of our oceans daily. Specifically, the Ocean Color Instrument and the Hyperangular Rainbow Polarimeter are both used to take wide scans of the water that covers over 70% of Earth's surface area. At the same time, the Spectropolarimeter for Planetary Exploration, or SPEX-1, takes a more detailed scan of specific areas of interest. And you may have noticed that all three instruments have names that indicate that they gauge color or act as spectrographs in some way, and that loops back to the targets we mentioned earlier. In terms of environmental science, our oceans are a huge piece of the puzzle. Too huge considering we don't know enough about how exactly these enormous bodies of water act on weather and affect climate change. But scientists are pretty sure it has to do with plankton the microscopic organisms that live on or near the surface of water. 
the tool's onboard pace can identify specific types of these creatures from the color of light they reflect alone. Most plant plankton species absorb a lot of carbon to grow, and with more carbon in the atmosphere, they can grow out of control. On a small scale, this can contaminate usable water and choke out other life in the ocean that we need to survive, like fish. On a large scale though, plankton can change our climate in drastic ways. Which is where the aerosol part of the pace targets comes into play. When plankton and different types of bacteria consume plant plankton, they can release a certain amount of organic compounds that get spread into the air, becoming aerosolized. These particles can absorb and reflect sunlight in ways that can change how clouds form, or even how storm systems move and grow. The mission itself was almost scrapped several times during the Trump administration, but luckily Congress was able to keep funding going long enough for the design and build phases to be completed, and this new administration to fund a launch. Now that it's up in orbit, PACE will spend its time gathering this data on how plankton are reacting to the greenhouse gases we create, and will then be able to build weather models that will help us control that spread, or at least that's the hope. The team at Collins Aerospace and ILC Dover have announced the successful completion of a key mobility test using their new EVA spacesuit they are designing to help NASA replace their aging equipment on the International Space Station. The test took place on January 30th on board NASA's Zero Gravity Plane Testing Vehicle, a modified passenger jet sometimes jokingly referred to as the Vomit Comet for the way it achieves the feeling of weightlessness needed for equipment and personnel testing. The plane flies in a parabolic arc, upwards and then downwards, quickly allowing the passengers to achieve functional weightlessness for a few seconds. For this test, the zero-gravity plane made 40 parabolas, allowing former NASA astronauts John Olivas and Dan Burbank to complete a series of objectives in short spans while wearing the prototype suits and trying not to get sick. The tests involved taking the suits on and off, testing the range of motion, the air pressure, capacity, and comfort, as well as how easy it was to use the sorts of tools they'd have to work with on the space station itself. The team also brought on a one-to-one -one scale model of the ISS airlocks to see how well the astronauts could maneuver into and out of the space station these suits will likely be used on. After a few days of going over the data and checking NASA's current EVA suits, the team at Collins announced a complete success. From here, the Collins Dover team expect to make more design reviews and complete underwater testing in NASA's pools at the Neutral Buoyancy Lab, but things seem to be moving ahead without many difficulties. Which isn't really a surprise considering their partners. ILC Dover created the first EVA suits for the Apollo program and the current suits that they're trying to replace. Years of development and technological advancement have allowed ILC Dover to get another crack at designing a suit that will fit astronauts with a wider range of body types and fix some of the bigger issues with older suits like the stilted range of motion. Collins and ILC Dover are developing this suit for space station use as well as a planetary EVA suit as part of the roughly $97 million exploration extravehicular activity services contract that they were awarded back in 2022 alongside Axiom Space, who are designing their planetary suit first instead. NASA loves redundancy, and having both companies work on suits at the same time will allow them to pick the best ones at the end of the process, and finally replace the roughly 40-year-old suits they're using now, just in time for the first moon landings of the Artemis missions. On February 9th, the Earth was hit by a glancing blow from a massive X-class solar flare that ended up knocking out shortwave radio transmissions across a huge area of the southern hemisphere for the duration of the event. Even though the path of the flare itself was thankfully in the process of turning away from us at the time, South America, Africa, and the southern Atlantic were in the sun at the time, and the atmosphere above that whole area was bathed in strong X-rays, ionizing the upper layer of the thermosphere and disrupting radio for a bit. Solar flares are ranked from A, B, and C as the weakest, with A-class flares being unable to even affect Earth in a noticeable way, all the way up to M and X-class flares, which are big enough to cause actual problems. The flare on February 9th was an X 3.38. 
Solar physicists took to social media during the event to put things into context, including a nod to the fact that if the Earth had been pointed directly at the sunspot which had fired off this flare, the results could have been much worse, as a huge coronal mass ejection was recorded alongside this event. A coronal mass ejection is when a sunspot sends out a wave of magnetized plasma, those big strings of material you can sometimes see in NASA Solar Sciences videos. They are frequently larger than the Earth is, and getting hit by one can do anything from knocking out power and radio to giving us those beautiful auroras we sometimes see in the night sky. Solar weather ebbs and flows on an 11-year solar cycle, and this most recent flare is just one of many similar events happening as we approach the most active part of this sequence, also called the solar maximum. Barely a day before we were hit by the X-Class flare, a sunspot that is known for shooting off slightly weaker M-Class events rotated into view of not just Earth, but also Mars, where the Perseverance rover even caught sight of it. Luckily, we are at a point in our history where we have organizations and technology which can at least provide early warnings for us, like the Space Weather Prediction Center run by NOAA and a fleet of observation satellites. Not all flares are dangerous, luckily, but if even a glancing blow can shut off radio for a bit, that's cause for some extra study at least. Maybe we can eventually learn to protect our infrastructure enough that even an X-Class flare won't be much of an issue.